Welcome, welcome. It's good to be back with you guys. Super excited, especially if you're a visitor to Sandals Church. Thank you so much for coming to our series called You. This is a series about you, even if you've never been in church in your life. Listen, I want you to know that Christianity is a relational movement in three directions. Upward towards God, outward towards our neighbors, and inward towards our souls. Jesus says this, that the greatest commandment in all of the Bible is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor, wait for it, as yourself. Look, becoming a Christian isn't just about getting to know God. Becoming a Christian is about getting to know yourself. You ever wondered, why does God love me? Why, why, why did God send his son to die on the cross for me? Why do I matter so much to God? You see, the Bible isn't all about God. It's all about God's love for you, for me, for us. And for a lot of us, even those of us that call ourselves Christians, it's really, really hard for us to say, yeah, God loves me. I matter. This is who I am. Look, for the next couple of weeks, man, I mean, I don't say this lightly. I believe these sermons will change your life, change your marriage, change the way you see your kids, change the way you see your spouse. Some of you might like your spouse again after this series. Feel free to laugh unless they're sitting next to you because you might not be invited back next week. You know, for some of you, it's gonna give you grace to finally get along with that person at work that instead of loving, you've been judging. For you to have a little sympathy for people who maybe raise their kids a little bit differently from you. I don't know if you've noticed, but we're different. Have you noticed that? Like we, we come from different ethnicities. We come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. We have different genders. Like we, we come from different worlds. Even if you were raised in the same home, anybody ever look at your brother or your sister and go, where were you raised? <laughs> like, I'll listen to my brother talk about our childhood, and I'll be like, I, I, I don't know where that was. We see things differently. And in this series, we're going to talk about three things. How do you, how do you perceive the world? Not everybody sees the world the same way you do. If you're married, give me an Amen right? Two different eyes looking at the same thing, but you see it differently. We perceive the world differently, and then we process what we perceive very differently. Here's what I thought I saw, and here's how that makes me feel. And then we present ourselves in a certain way. So this is a series called You. It's about you. God loves you. God sent his son to die for you on the cross. God cares about you, and God wants to transform and change you. He wants to enhance the beauty that's in you, and he wants to begin to heal the brokenness that's in all of us. I don't know if you noticed, but we're broken. The world is broken, right? Even as we speak, once again, nations are at each other's throats. The Cold War we thought was gone is, seems to be coming back, and, and there are threats being literally shared back and forth between, between nations. The world's broken, and we need to be healed. But for that to happen, the world doesn't need to heal. You and I need to heal. And then we can take that peace that's inside of us and we can begin to share it. And so I just want you to know that about 15 years ago, I encountered this thing called the Enneagram. For some of you who don't know what it is, it's simply a tool. And let me say this, it's the best tool I've ever found to begin the process of being real with yourself. Our vision at Sandals Church is to be real with yourself. So you say, that's great, that's a great vision. How do I do that? This is the best tool I've found to help you in that process. It's helped me understand my wife. It's helped me understand me. It's helped me to understand my kids. It's helped me to understand some of you. Because for some of you, I was praying God would lead you somewhere else. Right? It's not always just people that want to change churches. Sometimes pastors are hoping people will be led by the Spirit somewhere else. But it's helped me to understand people. And, and, and it's that first step into understanding ourselves. So I just want to begin with a word of prayer. I want everybody to relax. I want you to know that everything that we're going to do in this series is out of the Bible, but what we're going to do is we're going to use this tool to help God begin to teach you about yourself. Because not all of you have the same strengths and not all of you have the same weaknesses. We're all sinners, but we sin in very different ways. So let's bow our heads and let's pray together and ask God to just really speak to us in this series. Heavenly Father, I just pray in Jesus' name, through the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that you would connect us to ourselves in a way that you see us, in the truth that you see, in the light that only you can see. God, wrap your arms around us and show what's beautiful about us. And God, 
in a way that only you can, show us what's broken and help us to give grace for ourselves in the same way that you do. So Father, bless this series, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, a series called You. We're going to start with the personality type that I call the reformer. I want you to know this is not me. This is also called the good person. This is not me. That's not who I grew up. I, I did not grow up this way. I, I've been broken since the day I was born. Uh, the reformer is the person who, who see, sees how things could be. You can write this down there. They're, they're kind of a perfectionist. I have zero perfectionist in me, Right? My wife has a lot of one in her. This is who she is. Always wants to make sure she looks good. I just assume I am good. Let's just roll. I look good. This is what you get. Let's go. Okay? I don't change outfits any time. I got one outfit. Let's get out the door. The reformer wants things to be perfect, wants to be good, wants the world to be a better place. And so they see flaws. They see how things could be different. And so we're going to start off with an amazing story from Jesus, and I think a lot of you miss this. Even if you know this story, a lot of you fail to recognize this. Now, you don't have this in your notes, but I'm gonna start in Luke 15, 11. This is where the story starts. And Jesus says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told him a story. Listen to me, some of you've never paid attention to this. Here's the story and how it begins. Jesus says, a man had two sons. How sad is it for 2,000 years we've called this story the prodigal son? It's not a story about one kid. It's a story about two. And so here's what's amazing is the one son who screws up, gets his life right, and has a right relationship with God at the end of the story, we focus all the attention on that and not on the other son. It's a story about two kids. Listen to me, parents. Your kids are going to be different. You have to treat them different. You have to love them different. You have to approach them differently. Right? I mean, some of you as parents, you're like, how on earth did you come from the same household? Each one of them comes out so radically different. Even if you're biological twins, you can be very, very different. So Jesus tells us this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, this is offensive. He says, I want you to share your estate with me now before you die. So when do you get the inheritance from your parents? When they die. It's a little inappropriate and say, dad, you're kind of lasting a little longer then I, I thought you would, and um, I, I want my money, so give me my money. So the younger son wants his money. What's amazing is the father agrees, and so he divides his wealth between his two sons. Now, here's how it went in the ancient world. The oldest son got two-thirds of the estate, and the younger son would get one-third unless there are sisters. If there are sisters involved, each sister gets a dowry. And so she gets money set aside to make you know, her more appealing for marriage. So the young guys, his, his inheritance is going to be chopped up based upon, first of all, he loses the two-thirds from the older brother. Then he gets his one-third, subtract any sisters that he has. We don't know about any sisters. And remember, it's a made-up story. So just remember that. People always get a little crazy. Jesus is telling a story to prove a very real point. So what happens? This guy goes off and he parties. He gets all of his money. He gets the stuff from his dad, he goes off, he has wild living, he loses all of his money, everything goes crazy, right? And that's often what happens when young people gain wealth too soon. They didn't earn it, they don't know how to handle it. And so his life begins to fall apart. Here's where the story picks up in your outline. When he finally came to his senses, he finally comes to his senses and he says to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying. He begins to become real with himself. I've made a mistake. Anybody ever been there? This is not working out well. People always ask me, why do you follow God? I say, well, I tried following myself. <laughs> I did that. I was really good at it. Didn't have good outcomes, but I was good at following myself, my desires, my hearts. He says, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. It's always amazing how lame your kids think you are until they get out on their own. Isn't it amazing how smart, smarter your parents are once you start paying bills? All of a sudden, you're the light Nazi. Turn that off. Turn that off. Turn that off. I don't care if it's 110 inside. We can sweat it out. He says, I know. I'll go home and I'll say to my father, I have sinned against both you and heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He says, please take me on as a hired servant. 
Think about this. He's thought about his apology before he comes home. This kid's serious. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. He embraced him and he kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I want you to notice here the father stops him. He doesn't make him run through the whole speech again. But his father said to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. I want you to know that this is not the robe he left. This is the robe reserved for visiting royalty and wealthy guests. This is the best piece of clothing the household has. Give me the finest robe. Then he says, give me a ring for his finger. Remember he said, I'm not worthy to be called your son. I want you to think about if you're married, when you got married, you put a ring on a finger and you said, with this ring, I thee wed. The ring symbolizes the permanence of family. You're not a slave, you're my what? You're my son. And then in the ancient world, one of the ways that you could tell a slave from a son was shoes. Put sandals on his feet. He's not my slave. He's my son. And kill the calf we've been fattening. Apparently, they thought there was going to be a party, but here it is. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. And think about that. I thought this son was gone. Man, this weekend, this, excuse me, not this weekend, this last week, Tammy and I were invited to the White House, which is a whole story I'll share probably over the next couple of weeks. But we got to be a part of a debrief where we sat with President Trump's staff and they just began to talk about some of the issues that religious people are facing around the world. And here we are sitting in the White House with this briefing, and one of Donald Trump's core cabinet members, as she begins to share, this is what she says. She says, before I begin to tell with you about the things that are going on in the world, can I ask for prayer? It's one of Trump's cabinet members, and this is what she shared. She said, my daughter's missing. Here she is, in one of the most powerful positions in the world. She can't find her own kid. She said, would you guys please pray for me? And then she got a little uneasy and she said, are there any press in here? And no, let's pray. And we did right there. Isn't that interesting? No matter how powerful you are, no matter what your position is, when you're missing a kid, life isn't right. Nothing's right. Would you pray for me? That's how this dad feels in this story. It doesn't matter how successful he's been. It doesn't matter how, 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 how blessed he's become. He's missing a kid. And he thought the kid was dead, but he's alive. He thought the kid was gone forever, but he's home. And now it's time to party because the son I thought I lost. And yeah, he's an idiot, but he's my idiot. He's found. And so the party began. Meanwhile, how many sons were there? Two. We got two boys, moms, dads. We got two sons. We got an idiot. And we got the kid everybody wants. We got the kid that does the right thing. We got the kid that does well in school. We got the kid, my son is an outstanding student at, boom. My parents never got that sticker. My parents never shared stories about where Matt was gonna go to college. They're like, we don't know. We don't know. I found out the day of graduation in high school, I was graduating. <laughs> yes! Woo! Here's your robe, all right. <laughs> Meanwhile, the older son, underline this, where is he? Where is he? Doing what he's supposed to be doing. Why, that's what reformers do. They get crap done, thank God for them. And let me just say this, for everybody who wants to be critical of good people, without them there's no Sandals Church. <laughs> Do you know why? They serve. Do you know why? They tithe. Do you know why? They're here. 
Some of you are praying every single weekend. I don't know if we're going to go to church this weekend. I got to feel it. I got to get in my yoga position. Man, ones are here. Boom. It's the Lord's day. We're in church. Thank God for these people. They pay for these buildings you're sitting in. They pay my salary so you can hear this truth. A lot of you are the idiots out with the pigs. Coming into church. Oh, man, that was a rough weekend. You know? Our ones, they're not in Coachella. They're not. No. They're here. You wait for the sevens. They're in Coachella. They'll come back. They're going to come back. He's in the field work. He's getting stuff done. Can you imagine? Everybody wants to be critical. Oh, you're such a good person. If we didn't have good people, can you imagine what the world would be like? What if everybody just drove on the highway like you did? You know what I saw this week on the 91 freeway? I saw someone flip around accidentally without hitting anyone and go the wrong direction on the 91 freeway. I don't even know how it was possible. What are you doing in your car? Ones are driving. They're not on their phone. They're not texting. They're praying for your soul because you're going to hell and they know it. They're good people. They get stuff done. You know what we love to hire at Sounds Church? Ones. Because they work. They get stuff done. So where is he? He's in the field working. When he returned home, oh, I know my brother's home. Why? I can hear Coachella. <laughs> I can hear it. He heard the music and the dancing in the house. Oh, man. The father thought he was dead. The good son was probably hoping, right? Jeez, my little brother's an idiot. Not mine, this guy's. I love my brother. He heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of his servants, what's going on? Your brother is back! Woo! And your father killed a cow! That's a party. Somebody's alive, someone must die. The cow. We are celebrating because of his safe return. Underline this. And the older brother wouldn't what? Go in. Why? It's not fair. It's not fair. Listen to me, ones. Life's not fair. It's not fair. Quit keeping score. Quit keeping score. Right? Ones are monitoring. They're like the world's referees. Foul! <laughs> Foul! My wife has a lot of one. We're in line to the airport. Someone's cutting. She's foul. <laughs> TSA, taser, that rule breaker. You know what I told her? It's going to be okay, babe. We're going to make it. We're going we're gonna to make it. We're going we're gonna to be okay. Yeah, but he's, he's cutting. It's okay, babe. It's okay. Right? It's not fair. It's not fair. You know if you have a child that's a one, when you pour cereal before they eat, the first thing they do is evaluate. Okay, I can eat it now because the portions are equal. Right, it doesn't matter if the one is the smallest child. It's like, you're 30 pounds, your brother is 180. The cereal bowl should be fair. The older brother was angry and he wouldn't go in. His father came out, underlined this, and begged him. Come on, son. He says, all these years I've slaved for you. I've never once refused to do a single thing you told me. I do everything right. And thank God for you. Someone has to pay their taxes. <laughs> right, ones, they pay their taxes on time. And they don't cheat. Thank God for you. We love you. He says, in all that time, you never gave me even a young goat. You killed the cow for the idiot kid. I don't even get a goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours, notice what he says, not my brother. When this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes. Hmm, how do you know that? I don't know. It's an interesting little addition to the story. You celebrate him by killing the fatted calf, not the skinny calf. Fine, kill the skinny cow. He gets the fat cow. 
His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me. Listen to me once, God sees what you do and you will be rewarded. You will be rewarded. And one day, God will measure out in proportion to how you served. But today's not that day. Today's about your brother was dead and now he's alive and that's something to celebrate. Look, dear son, you've always stayed with me. Everything I have is yours. Do you know that that's actually true? Because the story began with the father, what? Divided his assets. He's actually taking the fatted calf from the oldest son. It's his cow. And he's giving it to the idiot son. And what does that feel like, ones? Stealing. Stealing. We divided the estate, idiot junior, blew all his money, I've invested it, that's why the cow is fat, dad. <laughs> he said, you've always stayed with me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is what? He's found, he's found. Listen to me once. The first thing I wanna challenge you is to praise God that God made you a one, that he put that in you, that he gave you a desire. You were born from the moment you came out the chute, you were born with a desire to do what's right. And that's beautiful. It's beautiful. The reformer, write this down. The reformer refre reflects God's goodness. Do we need more goodness in the world? Yes. Do we need any more prodigal sons? No, we're good. We're good, right? Do we need to lose any more children? No. We need to praise God for these good kids that reflect the goodness of God. They, they care about what's right. They care about what's true. They reflect the goodness of God. This is how you reflect your maker. First Peter 2.9 says this, but you are not like that for you're a chosen people, you are royal priests, you're a holy nation, you're God's very own possession. As a result, underline this, you can show the others the goodness of God. Listen to me once, this is what you do. You show people there is good in the world. You do what's right even when you don't feel like it. Praise God for you. Praise God for you. I praise God for you. I love you. There's no Sandals Church without you. There's no kingdom without you. You serve, you give, you tithe, you show up, you build, you do the right thing when everybody else is doing the stupid thing. Thank God for you. You're God's possession and as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. But underline this, he's called you out of darkness. So if you're the good person, if you're the perfect person, what's your darkness that God's calling you out? None of us is perfect, even if we strive for perfection. So if you're a good person, let me ask you this question, what's your sin? And this is what's so tragic, especially if you grew up in the church. If you're a one, you don't have a good testimony. You don't, your testimony's lame. You don't have a, you know, Vegas heroin and prostitute story. You just don't. You're like, one time I drank a Diet Pepsi and had a crazy headache and, you know, I just, I just never am gonna do Splenda again. That's my story. And it's tragic, right? It's tragic that in the church that we've, we've drummed up the prodigal son stories and we fail to understand that both sons need the gospel for different reasons. Both sons were lost. One son was an idiot, but the other was judgmental. And listen to me if you're a one, I don't believe this story was ever about the prodigal son. Do you know why I don't believe that? Because his whole life is fixed. We know everything that happened to him do you know how it ends with the good son? We don't know. 
Do you know why I believe that? Because this is a made up son. Jesus isn't talking about this boy, he's talking about you. And here's his question, reformer. Can you trust me? Can you trust that I'll be good to you like I am to these idiots that come to me? Can you trust me that I'm gonna reward you for your faithfulness? You see, here's how Satan tempts you, reformers. Is God really good? Is the father in the story really good? Is what, he, is what he's doing really wise? Because here's, here's, here's the point if you're a one. Not only does the son think his brother's an idiot, he thinks his father might be one too. And that's sin. He's called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. So what's the motivation? What's the core motivation if you're a one? To do what is good and right. What's the right thing to do? You ask this before you ask, what do I want to do? Most of us, we say, well, I'm gonna do whatever feels good, not ones. We'll, we'll get to feelings later. We're gonna do what's right. We're gonna make sure everybody's in their appropriate box. We're gonna make sure everything's in line. Everything's gotta be good and right. What's the core need of the one? Write this down, to be perfect. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. What does the one have to avoid at all costs? Criticism. Here's the thing if you're a one, do you know who you're the most critical of? Yourself. Yourself. You have the least amount of grace for yourself. Ones can be very, very critical to their children, to their spouses, to their friends. They can be very, very critical to their employers or their employees. Write this down. This is what ones do. They should all over themselves and others. If it sounded like I cussed, I almost did. <laughs> they should. You should. You should. You should. You should. You should all over yourself and everyone else. You need to stop shooting on everybody. <laughs> See, those, none of those are ones laughing. Right now, ones are like, I don't know. I, that's what's well. What does the one focus on? Flaws. Some of you are like, I can't believe he said should. I can't believe he said just, just. Ba -ba -ba. He's wearing army pants. That's inappropriate for church. I don't, I don't know why he's doing that. Listen to me, ones. All you see is your flaws. My wife's a one, or at least has a lot of one in her. She cut her hair this week. She says, do you like my hair? I said, I like you. We're good. We're good. Hair, no hair. I prefer hair, but you know, just, we're good. You know, I like, I like you. I like you. Short, blonde, whatever, gray, right? We're getting older. It's good. I'm in it for the long haul. I like you. Because what my wife tends to see is how beautiful she's not. And what she needs to be reminded of is how beautiful she is. Right? That, 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 that's, that's what we have to do for ones. They don't give themselves or anyone else any grace. They focus on their flaws, and guess what that does? It creates a core sin called, write this down, anger. What is the older brother's response to the party? He was angry, and he refused to go in. Your brother's alive. How does that make you feel? That ticks me off. If life was fair, he'd be dead. <laughs> and here's the thing. Your core fear, if you're a one, is being flawed. And guess what? You are. You are. So your nightmare is like every day, over and over and over again. 
You're not perfect. You will never be perfect. And the harder you try, the worse you're going to get. So let's talk about some biblical truths to pursue. Now, let me give you the one's favorite Bible verse, and then let me just shatter it. Here's the one's favorite Bible verse. It's not in your notes. Matthew 5, 48. But you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. (laughs) Do you know why we have that in our Bibles? Because of a Catholic priest named Jerome. Do you know what Jerome's problem was? He fell in love with a nun. Some smoking hot nun in Rome. (laughs) And it was affecting his holy life. And so he confessed it to his bishop, and his bishop said, as penance, if you don't know what that is, it's a Catholic word for like repenting, as penance, this is what his bishop said, you will go to Bethlehem and learn Hebrew. That's the worst thing that you can do. And so Jerome did. He went to Bethlehem, to the place where they believed Jesus was born, and he buried himself in a cave, and he learned Hebrew, and he translated the Hebrew scriptures into Latin. And when he came to this Greek word teleos, he translated it Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And listen to me, every translation is built upon a previous translation. They're all influenced by them. And so literally for 1700 years, we go all the way back to Jerome who said, be perfect as your heavenly father is imperfect. The problem is teleos doesn't mean perfect. It means whole, complete. That's what it means. It doesn't mean bake the perfect pie ones. It means make sure you have all the slices. That's what it means. Be complete as God is complete. And what you're missing is God. You're missing God. So here's a biblical truth for you to pursue. Quit, don't make Matthew 5, 48 your favorite verse. I'm gonna submit Ephesians 4, 26. And don't let... Sin control you by letting your anger control you. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And some of you are like, well, then I would never sleep. I'm a one. (laughs) That's how I go to sleep at night is I count all the sins of my spouse. (laughs) I don't count sheep, I count sin. One, two, three, four. Don't, listen, nobody's perfect. Why do you think the older brother's younger brother is an idiot in the story? Because we're all idiots compared to you once. All of us. We're out partying. (laughs) And you're just righteous. I mean, Jesus is a genius. He knows exactly what ticks you off. Idiots. Idiots. Blowing their life, screwing their life up. And God, I know you have a list in heaven, but we will compare notes when I get there. And we will make sure that every, every sin is accounted for. Here's the problem. When you focus on the sins of others, it makes you angry. And when you allow anger in your life, it gives the devil permission in your life. And that's not even close to perfection. That's evil. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Look, you can be angry, but don't let it get a hold of you. Don't let it destroy you. One's pursuit of perfection can destroy their marriage. You can want a perfect marriage and end it. You can want perfect children and ruin them. You got to learn to relax. Sometimes just go in the cabinet and move the beans to the, like, you know, over to the rice and just like get crazy put a chocolate bar, you know, over by the crackers. It's it's a party in my house. You know, just embrace life. Embrace it. Because your desire for perfection will ruin you. It will destroy you. It will wreck you. Your kids will never be perfect. Do you know why they were being raised by you? Okay. Your company, your clothes, your church will never be perfect. We're going to screw it up. We're going to mess it up. There's a bloody, gross cross with a dead Jesus on it that says nobody's perfect. 
Nobody's perfect. That's why we're Christians. Don't let sin control you. Don't let anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Listen to me, ones. This is your confession every night before you go to bed. God, help me. Help me to forgive this imperfect world that's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair, but listen to me, God is good. You see, ones, here's the question for you as the good son, do you trust your father? Who knows best, you or dad? That's the story. Well, you're a one, so you know what's best. And God would do well to listen to your wisdom. Well, let me ask you this, ones, who gave you your wisdom? God did, trust him, trust him. Here's a verse for how you relate to others. Make an allowance for other people's faults. You're gonna have an idiot brother. You might marry an idiot. Yeah, my wife's prayed this many times. <laughs> Lord, she did not marry a one. She did not, she married the prodigal son. She did. She strapped herself to an idiot forever. <laughs> Make an allowance for each other's faults. That's why I'm a professional apologizer. <laughs> do you know what the hardest thing for one to do? To say, I'm sorry. Because that means you have to admit you were wrong. <gasps> <gasps> what happened? You're human. Right? One time I said to my wife, and I don't recommend this. <laughs> I said, just say it. Just say it. She's like, what? You're wrong. Just, I'll help you. I say it all the time. I'm wrong. I screwed up. I'm sorry. Does that feel good? It's empowering. Not for a one. Make an allowance for each other's faults. And forgive anyone, oh, who offends you. Ones are professional offenders. Not offenders, offend, they get offended. That offends me. That is offensive. You're the offensive police. There's defensive and offensive, and you're the offensive. That's offensive. Why? Why ones do you need to learn to forgive people? Because the Lord Jesus forgave you. For what? Your sin. And what's your sin? It's self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is believing that you are right within yourself. Righteousness comes from God. Only God is truly right. Only God is truly good. So it's okay for you to make a mistake. It's okay for you to screw it up. It's okay for you to, to mess it. It's okay. We, we have a wonderful Savior and a wonderful God that can forgive us, and hopefully there are Christians in your life that can extend grace to you. But a one's greatest fear is that someone's going to treat them the way they treat themselves. It's okay, ones. We know you're better than us, but you're not perfect. We praise God for how awesome you are. Yay, you. But you're still a sinner, and you're still gonna blow it. And you know what that means? You can do your very best and still have a screwed up marriage. You can do your very best and still struggle at work, struggle in friendships and struggle in relationships. Sometimes your best isn't good enough. So you know what you need? Grace. You can have good intentions and still sin. See, what ones will do instead of saying I'm sorry is they'll say this, well, what I meant to do, I didn't mean to slay your heart. What I meant to do was to say, wouldn't you look better in a different outfit? Right? When you look at your kid and you see seven A's and all you talk about is the B minus, that's the one in you. It's the one in you. Don't try to make your kids be something you can't be yourself. Make an allowance for each other's faults. Everyone that drives is an idiot and so are you. 
right? I always, you can always identify ones on the freeway, they're going. <laughs> and I'm just like, uh. <laughs> You wanna see something funny? Put a one in the passenger seat. <laughs> Man, I don't, I, if, if I didn't have to keep all my attention on the road to not kill my family, I would just watch my wife while I drive. She, just, she does the brake thing. It doesn't work ever, but she. <laughs> right? Man, sorry, she's gonna kill me. All right. Okay. Bible verse for your relationship with God. Jesus says this, why do you call me good? Jesus asked, underline these words once. Only God is good. Only God is good. And if you grew up in the church, you say, God is good, you say, all the time. Only, good, only God is good all the time. Once, you're good most of the time. Most of the time. Psalms 8615, but you, O Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Listen to me once, isn't it good to know that God is faithful to us when we screw up? that God can enter into a beautiful, wonderful relationship with us that is perfect because of Christ, even when we are imperfect. Your core sin is anger. You have to pursue grace. Grace. And think about this. How does God, how does God deal with his anger for sinners? He poured grace over us on the cross. How do you deal with your anger? You ask God to give you grace for self and for others. And listen to me ones, in your darkest moments, you're going to accuse God of not being good. In your lowest, darkest moments, because life does not always make sense. But here's the difference. Ones, we see rules. Jesus sees souls. Do you see the difference? It's two games. Ones are playing for perfection. Jesus is trying to save souls. And my idiot son, who was dead, has been found. And so we're gonna celebrate that. God's inviting you to celebrate. And listen to me, ones. Listen to me. He's inviting you to the party. Your anger will keep you from the party. He's inviting you, he's begging you, please come to the party. I wanna challenge you to pray this prayer this week. I wrote this for you if you identify with the one, the reformer. It says, God help me not to seek perfection, but to seek you. See. That's completeness, that's being whole. It's not just about getting life right, it's about getting God. Help me to see others the way you see them, not as perfect, but as perfectly loved. As perfectly loved. Listen to me, reformers, that's how God loves you, perfectly. Perfectly, and he's inviting you to love others in the same way way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would all, God, find grace for ourselves. God, right now, I know the ones are just spinning with criticism for themselves, and so God, I just speak to the enemy right now, and I pray that you would block that, and that you would just reassure them, God, that they're the best amongst us, the most moral, the most right, and the most pure, but they're still sinners. God, and they need grace just like all of us. God, help them to know that they reflect your goodness. But God, like all of us, they need your mercy. I pray in the name of Jesus, they would find the mercy they need at the cross. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.